Cool. Okay, so we're going to start. It's sort of like history. Um, you start off with cryptography. So cryptography is the study of secrets, and secrets are really cool. Like, there's nothing cooler than secrets. Um, so the, the main problem is, I want to tell you something. I don't want all these guys to hear. So, oh shoot, like, I, okay, so the solution, whisper. Pizza. Okay, I got the message across, you guys didn't hear, we were, uh, done, done, right? Cryptography, over. Pizza. Okay, this, <laughs> the NSA. <laughs> um, so that's not actually a solution, because the whole problem is you want to talk to someone on an insecure channel. So the assumption throughout cryptography, throughout this whole thing is, you can do math on your own, you can keep your own secrets, but everything you say and communicate on the network, uh, they're watching you. And they see every bit that comes out and record every single bit and byte that, they're, that you're moving around the internet. Um, this is in actually kind of a quite accurate assumption, it turns out. Um, we now know quite a bit that there is a they. And so <laughs> there is definitely a they, and they're watching. So in case you, in case you thought you didn't really need this, now you know you do. Okay, so there's some custom terms. Uh, I don't actually use it too much here, but Alice and Bob are like the prototypical cryptography people, and Alice is trying to talk to Bob, and vice versa. Eve is the one listening in. So uh, we found out how many Eves there are and where they work and jet off to Hawaii and stuff. Eavesdropping. Um, yeah, eavesdropping, that's where it comes from. Okay, so the message, we, what we call a message, is the actual text, the actual thing that we want to communicate. So Alice wants to give Bob a message. Ciphertext is a message that's been somehow changed so that Eve, when seeing it, has no idea what's going on, hopefully. And a key is some kind of number that turns the message into the ciphertext. So it's like a password, but we'll go into that. Okay, so our first try, and this is thousands of years old, we have a substitution cipher. We take a secret onto an insecure channel, and here's how we do it. We change the letter A to B, the letter B to C, and so on, and we change the letter Z to A, so it loops back. Um, this works, right? Here's my cipher test. I, you know, I can send it, broadcast it, anyone seeing that is like, the heck does that mean? It means hello. Right, I took H, the next one's I, E, F, and L, L, M, M. So it's the word hello uh, with this cipher. If you want to go from message to ciphertext, you go forward a letter. If you want to go from ciphertext to message, you go back a letter. This works, right? You, you wouldn't know what that means. So this is a good crypto system. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's easy, but once someone figures it out, they can pretty much read everything. And it's really easy to figure out. Um, E is the most common letter in English, and in English you've got about one to two bits per letter. Um, it's very easy to predict words after they've started. So if you have, you know, H-E-L-L -L with no O at the end, you might just be hell, but probably he's going to say hello, that's a lot more common. So you can predict English pretty well. Um, a few lines is going to be enough to crack this code. You just sort of do some, some analysis, uh, some statistics about, okay, what letters are appearing, and pretty quickly you're gonna find, okay, it's just one letter shifted over. <clears throat> that was easy. So there's actually a key here, and that key is the number one, because you're shifting by one. So you can think of it as addition modulo 26. So we've got a set of characters, 26 letters of the alphabet, and to encrypt, we add one modulo 26, that's why the Z loops back to A, and to decrypt, we subtract one modulo 26, except we want to think, but anyway. So you could make a substitution cipher with a key of 13. So hello becomes U R Y Y B. It's it's the same thing. It's just a key is 13 instead of one. So with only 26 keys possible in this system, it's very easy to guess all possible keys. Um, that's called brute forcing. So brute forcing means you just guess and check. You say, okay, the key is a number from 1 to 26, except 26 wouldn't work because it so it's a number from 1 to 25. You just try 1, 2, 3, and see what message you get. And once you get a message that looks like a legit English sentence, you found the key. And that'll take, on a computer, no time at all. So how about we sort of have a block substitution cipher? Maybe we can make this a little better. Every five letters, we have a new key, a new amount of letters to shift. So we could start with 1, and then go to like 10, and then do 3. 
So now we can do 15 letters that split into five different ciphers. That can throw them off for a little while, but it's still not great. Also, the keys will get really big. If we want to send a really long message, we're going to need a fifth of the size of that message in key size. So maybe, so this, they, this was the state of the art in cryptography for several thousand years, um, where people were you know, saying, okay, well, we'll have the key, you know, the letter to shift, the number of letters to shift starts out as the number three, but then it goes up each letter. So it goes three, four, five, and then it loops around. Or it's some equation, you know, they, they tried all these sort of clever ways, and some of them are actually quite difficult to break. But they all are susceptible to different statistical analysis. And this was pretty much state of the art up until, like alphabetic, polyalphabetic ciphers were sort of up until World War I, between World War I and II when it started getting better. Okay, so how about this? What if every single letter had its own new key, a number to shift by? Um, then you can't help, you can't figure it out by letter frequency because each letter is getting shifted by an arbitrary amount. And you can even do that for, for digital data by having you know, each bit and you just XOR them. So you have a giant stream of What's ones. XOR? XOR is, if it's uh, the same, you get a, uh, wait, if, you, if it's the same, you get a zero. If it's different, you get a one. Okay. Exclusive or. Exclusive or, yeah. Um, so XOR is really useful in that it can be applied twice. So if you have like the simplest example, I will share a key that's an XOR key. Okay. What? Okay. Now, if it's a zero, don't change what I say. If it's a one, change what I say. Okay, now here's my message. Zero. So what's, you know, here's, that was my ciphertext. What's my real message? One, right? Because I said to flip it. So, so the idea is the key is flip or not flip the following number of bits. And then my message I take and I XOR with all those flip or not flip things. And as long as the other guy has the flip or not flip table, he can re recreate my message. But since the two things are the same size and the flip or not flip table could be anything, you get no information about the message from the ciphertext. So actually, this works. And in fact, this is perfect. And in fact, it's mathematically proven by a really smart guy, Quachent, to be perfect. And in fact, he proved that it's the only perfect method. And there is no other cryptographic method that is equal to the one-time pad. That's what this is called. <clears throat> um, so this is the only inform information theoretic secure cipher. And it works. And in some ways, it's very simple. You share, let's say we want to sh you know, be able to talk, uh, email each other. So we share a pretty big file. You know, we generate a random bunch of ones and zeros. I give it to you when we're you know, hanging out. And then we go our separate ways. And we can you know, XOR our message with chunks of that and send it to each other. And no one can figure out what we did without that initial uh, key. Is that, the, is that the theory of uh, what number stations are broadcasting? Because they're using one type pads? Or? Anybody know anything? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, so this was used in wartime, like, World, the, the, like I think in the Cold War too. The problem was when you reuse a one-time, it's called one-time pad for a reason. If you reuse it, you open yourself up to all these statistical analysis attacks um, because of the language and the low entropy of the messages that you're sending. Um, but if you use it once and you use it correctly, it's unbreakable, and that's like a mathematically proven thing. So how many sentences could you send without Given away it depends how big your key is. So you have to, your key, so that's, that's the next thing. Problem is, the key size is the same as the message size. And once you're out of key, you can't send any more messages. So you have to share, you know, if you want to be sending a emails, okay, let's first share like, you know, 100 megs of noise and that we both have a copy of. Then we can send emails for quite some time. But once you run out, you're, you're kind of screwed. You can try doing things like sending more, you, so people thought, oh, maybe we can send more key within the message, but it doesn't, it doesn't work out. Um, so for large messages, you need to hold huge keys. And each key can only be used once, so it, it doesn't scale well. It's, it's very secure, um, but you're, there's a big temptation to try to reuse a key. Which the key itself is like a challenge, right? Like, yeah. Right, well, you need, to, you need to have a secure channel initially. Right, so, the, so I get to that later. But the initial problem is you have to share a key first. So you have to be able to whisper to the guy first, then you can go off and communicate over an insecure channel. But there has to be some secure exchange to begin with. And there's the rub. 
Yeah, so that's that's a problem. Um, so, but what if we had some way to generate a big random number from a smaller random number? So if we could sort of extend this key. So we share like a one kilobyte key that's a bunch of ones and zeros, it looks random. And then we can sort of stretch that out so that we can use it for larger files. So that's um, what people do a lot. And this is, so I want to clarify, random and pseudorandom. So random in the case of cryptography means nobody knows what's coming next. So you have a random sequence and you look backwards, I don't know, it's flipping a coin, and there's no way to tell what, which bit comes next. Pseudorandom, however, means someone knows what's coming next. It's calculated. But given the past ones and zeros, you can't figure out what's next if it's good pseudorandom, right? So I have some secret that I'm using to generate this stream of ones and zeros. So I know what the next one's going to be. I can calculate the next one. It's all, you know, deterministic. But if you just see these things I'm calculating and try to do analysis on it, you're hopefully never going to figure out what the next bits are going to be, if it's a good uh, pseudorandom function. Well, so as this smart guy found, there's actually no mathematically provable pseudorandom function. They all leak some small amount of information. So the goal is to make it uh, computationally infeasible to figure out what's coming next, to make it like take until the universe burns out before they can figure out the probability of the next one. Um, so yeah, so wait. So both should be statistically white. So that means there's no bias in terms of more ones than zeros. You know, it should, there's a lot of statistical properties of both of these. And you sh they should look the same. Like a random number and a pseudo random number should look exactly the same. But one of them has some computation behind it. The other is just a physical process. Okay, so what we can do with a one-time pad, we can share a short key. So I'm just gonna make up some random number. And then we can use some math to generate a longer key from the short one. But we never expose that short key. Then we can just do the same thing as the one-time pad with this extended key. So actually, we call this a seed. A seed from a pseudo-random, for a pseudo-random number generator. And we share a seed, which can be short, and then using that seed, generate large uh, cipher, you know, so large keys, and use it the same way a uh, one-time pad is used. And this actually works pretty much. Um, it's called a stream cipher. And so a pseudo-random number generator, the, the names are really fun. Uh, blum blum schlub. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Is it schub or schlub? I think it's schlub. Anyway, uh, I think to be a cryptographer, you have to have a pretty an interesting name. There's no, like, Smith conjecture. It's always, like, these crazy unpronounced. Um, so this one, so some of the ways to generate a large random sequence from the large pseudo random sequence from a small key, uh, they keep squaring modulo a, pro, a, a product of two large primes. So imagine you know you have the number seven, square it, mod something, square it again, mod something. Uh, but mod, the modulo should be pretty big, so you have a large space, and it sort of it eventually can loop around, but it, if it's a big enough number, you'll never get there. Um, other one that's in hardware. This is the problem. With this is slow. I don't think anyone. I don't think there's any implemented blum blum schlub stuff. That's like the 70s. Um, linear feedback shift registers are you sort of take your bits and you sort of loop them back and do a little bit of plus minus kind of stuff and like keep shifting to usually to the right and like some of the bits that fall off become your random numbers. Um, these are very fast to do in hardware, but they've historically had problems with security. Uh, the really clever people can sort of see the output and eventually figure out what the seed is and what the internal state of the random number generator is, and then once you have that, you can start to predict. Is that some of the like, web security with this <clears throat> No, this is a long time ago. Uh, there might be. I don't know if there's any SSL linear feedback chef registers. I don't think so. This is, this is like 70s, 80s, like hardware stuff. Uh, before, you know, before you had computers that could quickly compute all these different things that we use now. Um, so this, a lot of this had to be done in hardware. Um, RC4 is a stream cipher that is used for SSL. You can probably use it as an option for SSH connections. So it's in most people's computers probably. Um, it's fast. It does have predictability problems, especially in the initial bits that come out. So I think most implementations actually drop the first 1,000 or however many bits. Because knowing those first bits that come out, leaks some information about the seed and 
the state of the uh, number generator. So, you have a stream cycle. Yes. How do you, so if you drop the first thousand bits, like how do you uh, share where you are in, this, in, the, in the key? You just, you, you agree, okay, this system, it's called RC4 drop 1K or something. I don't know, so the name. Everyone just knows. Yeah, everyone knows. knows. And if anyone loses place, you're kind of screwed. Oh, like, this yeah. This happened in World War One. they're like, uh-oh. So right, where where are we again? Like yeah, like you lose your little place little, in yeah. the thing. Yeah, that can be a problem too if you lose counter. Um, so so these are difficult. Usually, a stream cipher is used for one connection, and you use a bunch of smaller keys for each separate connection. The keys are small, so you can store a lot of them. Yeah, usually you don't keep a stream cipher running over multiple sessions. Um, okay, and then there's also block ciphers, which instead of a stream, sort of chop the message up into blocks and encrypt and decrypt that way. Um, they're similar in concept. Um, there's different methods. I don't want to go into it because it's kind of not related to Bitcoin. <laughs> um, don't use ECB. ECB is horrible, and there are still implementations of electronic codebook out there. Um, the simplest way is just counter mode, where so the problem with a block cipher and the way ECB does it is you chop up your message into lots of blocks, but you have the same key. So if you encrypt the same uh, message with the same key the output's going to be the same. So if you have a highly redundant message you're sending, and let's say your block is uh, you know, 512 bytes, and you've got like a big JPEG with a big blue sky or something, you're, you might have a lot of sections of 512 bytes that are the same as each other. And those will encrypt to the same ciphertext. And so a large, you know, if the people zoom out and sort of analyze the entire ciphertext, they're going to see those repetitions and know a little bit about what you're sending. And they might be able to say, hey, there's a large initial area of low, you know, low entropy redundancy. Maybe it's a picture with a sky on top. Um, you don't want that. So, so the easiest way to do it is counter vote, where you have your key and you just add one for the first block and add two for the next block and add three for the third. And initially, people didn't like that because they're like, we're adding a deterministic number. That's bad for security. But um, it works. And if, if adding a deterministic number to your key breaks your system, your system was broken anyway. Um, no, and then so people, that was actually a concern. Like, people felt funny. They're like, well, my key is this big random number and I'm just adding one, two, three to it. Um, but people have proven that no, it, it should work fine if your actual encryption works. Um, and Galois, Galois, Galois found counter mode is another mode that's used quite a bit. Um, so you can click in your like browser with the little uh, green lock icon and you can see what what algorithms are being used to encrypt your connection. Um, so block ciphers and stream ciphers are in some ways interchangeable, especially in counter mode. Um, so what's good is the, yeah, the cipher text is the same size as the message, doesn't expand your message at all, and the keys are quite small. Oh uh, yeah, here's an example of uh, electronic codebook where you have the little Linux penguin guy and you encrypt it with ECB and you can still see the penguin. It doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, if you encrypt it, encrypt it with counter mode, it's just total noise. So the other, the other sort of rule is generally try not to implement your own cryptography systems. Um, <laughs> you might be in a position where you have to and there's a lot of ways to screw up and make a big mess. So read up a lot about it and, and use like best practices. Okay, so another related thing to all these is a cryptographic hash function. It's a little bit different from a cipher, but in many ways similar. Um, what if we want to take a big set of data and condense it into a small set of data that looks like a pseudo-random number? You know, it looks uh, it's like white. Uh, why would we want to do that? Well, for file authentication was the original use of this. Um, you have a big executable file. You know, your exe file, run this.exe. And you're like, wait a second, run this.exe. That sounds a little sketchy. And people say, okay, well, I'm going to share a, the sum through a trusted channel. So the, the sum is very small. It's like MB, MB5 sum. And you can calculate that on your own computer to make sure that nothing has changed in these two files. So the idea of the hash function is you take an arbitrary size input, you get a small fixed size output, and any change in the input will change the output completely. Um, so it's useful for file authentication, also uh, commitment to public data. So if I have a secret that, you know, I don't know what's some stupid secret, uh, Britney Spears gets married or whatever, um, I can, 
I can hash that, right? And I have a hash output. And unless you guess the exact thing I wrote, you're not going to be able to figure, you're not going to be able to go backwards for that hash function. And then once the thing happens, I can assert it to everyone. And they can say, oh yeah, I remember he gave this hash thing. And it looks like he did know Britney Spears was getting married when he said he did, but he didn't want to tell us. Uh, so commitments to data can work that Could you also uh, use a hash function to do like data integrity checks? Yeah. You've got a database, you hash it, you know if someone's changed it. Right, right. You keep, you keep your hashes. There's all sorts of, so the initial thing was file authentication, but there's so many cool things you can do, like Bitcoin is another. You know, there's so many cool things that it actually ends up letting you do. Right, right. So if you want to store a password, a good way, a good thing to do is store the hash of the password, so that you salt it. Yeah, and salt it, and and all sorts of you know have a key stretching algorithm, something like a, a password key derivation algorithm that like takes some time. There's all sorts of uh, there's like you could you could have a whole like course on hash functions. Like people dedicate their lives to hash functions. So. It's cool, but yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so there's no key involved in a cryptographic hash function. The, the algorithm itself is sort of the key. Um, and it's sort of per block, you take any fixed input number and your output number is pseudo-random. Um, you can extend these functions to arbitrary lengths through either sequentially doing it, so like the way SHA-256 works is, okay, you take, how long is it? I don't remember, a couple hundred bytes and you hash that. And then you take your output and concatenate it with the next couple hundred bytes and hash that. So it's a linear process where you keep feeding stuff into it and your output keeps changing. Um, the one trick with that is if someone knows the hash of a one megabyte file, they might be able to add on a couple bytes at the end and also calculate the hash of that without having the original file. So there's some you know, line linear problems there. Uh, sponge functions are generally seen to be more sort of secure, which is like SHA-3 uses it, KCAC uses a sponge function, and um, SCAIN, there's some others that are, kind of, it's a kind of cooler thing where it doesn't work linearly, like you can plop, plop things in at any order you want in certain ways. Okay, so yeah, the basic idea of a cryptographic hash function, you have any size input, a fixed size output, the outputs are uniformly distributed over the output space. So if you have a, you know, n bit output two, from zero to two to the n minus one. Um, so in the case of SHA-256, it's a 256 bit, bit output. Um, it's infeasible to find an input given your output. You can't go backwards. It's also infeasible to find an output that's desired. That's called a pre-image attack. He's like, oh, I want this hash to, you know, I want this hash to output 37.4. You can't. You just have to try all these different things. You have no idea what the output's going to be until you just try it. Um, yeah. So it's also very easy to compute. They're very fast. Um, you can. They're they are designed to be implemented in hardware, and also designed to be very quick on non-hardware optimized platforms. So like, they use mostly like I think I did. Uh, yeah. So SHA-2. Um, so what Bitcoin uses is SHA-256, which is a variant of SHA-2. Uh, the same function can be used in 512-bit output mode, and I think 224, and there's 384. There's some other different flavors of it. Um, this is a picture of a round. It doesn't really matter, but this is like an XOR. So you take your eight things, and you sort of shift them around, and XOR them together, and add, and stuff like that. Essentially, think of it as shuffling a deck of cards, but in a deterministic way. You take the top of the deck of cards. Okay, if it's a spade, cut the deck. If it's a heart, you know, take three and put it on the bottom, that kind of thing, where you've got a set, you know, function to shuffle these bits around. And any change in the input completely changes the output. So what's the significance of 2 versus 256? It's the number of bits that you're... Oh, SHA, that okay, so, so there's SHA-0, SHA-1, and SHA-2, and now SHA-3, and these were just the, like, version numbers the NSA used to call these. Uh, SHA-01 and 2 are actually in-house NSA developments. SHA-3 was a sort of vote competition, so they get all... If, you're, if your machine is compromised, you're, you, you know hope. <laughs> um, so the idea is, and it's pretty simple, uh, you choose a prime P and a primitive mod root mod P. So that's, that's actually what I screwed up on the way here, trying to play with it. Um, 
So a primitive root, do I have to explain that? It's a number that when it will give you, it will, it will fully cover the entire space modulo that prime by exponentiation. Um, so like, two, so, so like if you have, um, how can I explain it? It's like mod seven and you use two as your base. You, it's not, it's not, two can't be a primitive root mod seven because you're only going to get two, four, and eight, which is one. Or wait, maybe it is. And then, oh yeah, it is probably. <laughs> okay, but, but, you know, if, as long as you exponentiate as much as you want, you'll be able to cover one through six with this two. So two to the whatever will get you one, two, three, four, five, and six. So wait, two, two is probably a primitive root mod seven. What? Two and eight. Well, so, but, but, yeah, but primitive root mod, okay, so, yeah, 2 is not a primitive root mod 8, but 8's not prime, but eight's not prime so you wouldn't use it anyway. But, yeah, anyway, so there's ways to calculate these primitive roots. Um, so the idea is, for integers a and b, g, and I didn't have the triple superscript thing in this, I don't, anyway, g to the a to the b is the same as g to the b to the a, modulo that prime. Um, and that's just, you know, property of exponentiation. So Alice chooses a, Bob chooses b. Uh, G and P are predetermined. These are like, you know, numbers we standardize. Um, but G to the A to the B is this mod P is the secret. Okay, so we'll try it. Um, P is 97, that's prime. G is 10, and it is a primitive root. I checked this time. Uh, so you need a calculator or some kind of thing to do exponents modulo. I'm A, you're B. Uh, you pick a B in Z, in the integers. It can be anything. Two digit numbers, probably fine. Um, and you tell us g to the b mod p, that's the big b. And I will tell everyone g to the a mod p, that's the big a. And then I will take big b to the a, and you take big a to the b mod p, and, <laughs> and then we have our shared secret. So it's a little bit of a mouthful, but we do it on, you know, in Python, or so in Python, sorry, the exponential in Python is just a double Okay, so I'm not going to do my side because wait, what was my secret? Oh shoot! <laughs> I don't remember my secret. Wait, wait. Oh, I can't do it on the screen. Brute force it. What was? It? Well, anyway, my big A is 79. My secret was like I don't remember. Anyway, um, but I have to remember to do this to get this to work. <laughs> Just read, just read it Just choose the new Okay, well, this is not. This is not. This is where we get 10. Okay, don't look. 10 to the. A little bit higher. A little bit higher. Do you want a computer that's not on the monitor? I can't see. What's going up? Yeah, I remember. Okay, good. Uh, but then it's like... <laughs> you can go to your display. <laughs> okay, I remember. Okay. Okay. Okay, so... Eve, Eve might have picked up on that. <laughs> yeah, this is... Okay, but this is... A, okay, so someone pick a little b and do 10... Um, uh, what's it? Asterisk, asterisk, your little b, percent sign 97. And tell me what that is. He's supposed to be less than... It can actually be any integer, I think, that's not one or zero, I think, right? I don't know. I think Just yeah, do some two-digit numbers. It, it can't be zero. It can't be so zero, can't and it can't be one. Okay. I think it can be two, if you want to do two. But I think, I think it, and over 97, I think it's still okay. Yeah. Okay, do you have one? Anyone? Anyone? 38. 38. Okay, so, whatever, I don't want to. Okay, so you, you're a uh, big B. 38. My big A is 79. Okay, so now you can calculate 38 to the 79 mod 97, but that's a secret, so don't tell anyone. And now I'm going to calculate 79 to the 38 mod 97. Oh, no, sorry, 79 to the 38. Oh, wait, I no, I did this wrong. He took now. 38 is his output. But wait, you, everyone knows this. You have to you have to raise it to little b. Right, little b, not. Yeah, not big b. No, 
doesn't know. I'm saying when I take when this you is, get her to no, the side. this is this is little a nothing again. Oops. <laughs> okay, well I'll put it here. Wait, wait, wait. Also, Google Calculator lets you do mod. Okay, but this is wait. This is thirty-eight, right? Yeah. And yeah, it's a. A to the B, and then B to the little a. Little a. Okay, we can just do it that way. <laughs> um, okay, so big B is 38, so now I do this and you do that. Okay. Right, you do 79 to your secret number, I do 38 to my secret number. I'll just do it here. Oh, so you're going to see it. <laughs> here, I'll hold on. <laughs> and then mod 97. Yeah, change your display pair. Okay. Just set it to a variable. Anyway. Variable. Okay, but we'll, we'll, I'll reveal it. So wait, first you tell your the secret that you get? 79. Oh, 79. Yeah. 79. So we, we share the secret. Yeah. You share the secret. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
which is, okay, so Euler's totient is how many numbers below that number are co-prime to that number. So for example, so for example, nine. No, let's do it. 17. Different. Seven, wait. No. Yeah, so, so don't, so for, for a prime number, this is always just gonna be x minus one, right? For a prime, every, none of the numbers are factors, but if you have like, for example, the number eight, well, one is a, you know, you don't count one, but you know, two is a factor. Wait, how does this work? <laughs> uh, so for a non-prime number, the non-factors, so not one, not two, three times anything does not equal eight, four times something does equal eight, five, six, seven. So the totient of eight, or no, the eight is four. <laughs> uh, it's the count of the numbers. That are the count of the numbers under that number that are co-prime and you know are not a factor of that number, basically. Okay. What? Isn't it? Six times nothing equals eight, so six counts. Shoot, I don't remember. Well, then you also have seven. <laughs> anyway, for prime number, so it's it's like hard to calculate. If you have a giant number, it's hard to calculate this in general. But if you have a prime number, you know for any prime number x, the totient is just x minus 1. Because every number underneath that prime doesn't create that prime, right? Um, so, and then one of the properties of this is that it's sort of commutative in that, like, okay, you have the p and q, and you can find the totient of n based on n minus p plus q minus 1 that way. So it, it's a shortcut that lets you get this phi of n. And then you also choose an e, which is going to be your, your base for like, where e is somewhere between 1 and this, and usually they use like, sometimes they use 3 and sometimes they use 655,000 something. <laughs> um, so anyway, you calculate d, where d is the multiplicative inverse modulo this Quotient of E. And that's your decryption key. And so your public key that you send everyone is N and E. And then D is the private thing that lets you decrypt. P, Q, and the phi of N stay secret. Uh, but you don't actually have to use them afterwards. But that's allowed, you know, because if any of these leak, you know, if P leaks, you can divide N by P, find Q, and you're like, oh, got it. And then you can find phi of N, and then you can calculate D from E. But if you don't know these things, you're not going to be able to calculate these. Uh, the thing that does this, that makes this really cool, is once you have all these sort of complex things, to encrypt, uh, your ciphertext is just your message raised to that E exponent, modulo n. And to decrypt, you just take your message, you know, your ciphertext raised to D, modulo n. And that's it. Um, so it's very quick to encrypt and decrypt once you have established. Uh, this D and E exponent. Um, you can't find D without knowing phi of n, and the shortcut to find phi to find phi of n is this n equals PQ. And P and Q are prime, so finding, you know, breaking n into P and Q is a problem that is very difficult. If you have a giant number, how do you find its prime factors when these prime factors are huge? Um, it'll look prime, right? It, it's odd, you try to divide it by anything, it doesn't work. Um, so trying to find P and Q given N is something no one knows how to do that quickly, or quickly enough anyway. Um, so it comes down to finding these two factors. Nobody knows how to do it, and hopefully there isn't one. If there is, then the whole thing goes out the window. I'm sure quantum would do that. Yeah, quantum would help. <laughs> There's, yeah. Is there a standard replacement for RSA in the event that it does? Stand, I don't know, standard. There's all sorts of replacements. If RSA fails, though, I would imagine a lot of these things are going to fail. If you can factor, uh, it depends how, but if, yeah, if you, someone comes up with like some crazy way to factor N into P and Q quickly, um, I would imagine it would require enough research and like, it'd be breakthrough enough. They would probably break uh, El Gamal and, and ECDSA and all these other ones too. But who knows? It also, it's, I mean, 
there's fields of mathematics devoted to this, right. which have been trying to do it as much as for people thirty years. Yeah, break crypto systems. Yeah. Kind of this is this is a like established problem for decades in mathematics, and you never you know there's no proof that this is computationally infeasible, and there's no proof that p does not equal np uh, yet. Maybe one day there will be, but right now it's you know the only proof is one time pad works, and nothing else works as good as one time pad. This is still based on, we've never been able to figure out a way to do this. Um, and we have pretty good people trying. So. Do you have a message that, you know, repeat? Um, so, you, so in practice, RSA and all these other uh, asymmetric public key algorithms are all dependent on these symmetric ciphers underneath. And you can see that, like if you click in your, uh, you know, wait for me to click on here, and it'll say, like, okay, um, yeah, so I'm using elliptic curve Diffie, Diffie Hellman exchange ECDSA, and it's encrypted using AES 128 Galois counter mode. So the initial key exchange is the elliptic curve, that's an asymmetric system, but then the actual, once you establish the session, you're using a symmetric cipher. And that's all, I mean, that's usually how it works. Okay, Bitcoin doesn't do that though. <laughs> so I've been talking about all these other things, and now we get to something Bitcoin actually uses. Well, there's a couple others that I talked about. Elliptic curve cryptography. Um, conceptually, it's similar to RSA in that you have a private key and a public key. It uses a discrete curve. This is continuous, but it makes it a lot easier to show. Uh, of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b mod p. And the curves look like this. Well, mod, if you get rid of the mod p, it looks like this. If you actually have the mod p, it just looks like a bunch of noise. And it doesn't look cool. And it's hard to figure out what's going on. Um, but the actual curve, you know, you can imagine a curve. This is just y squared equals x cubed minus 4x plus 0. Um, so this, these curves have kind of cool properties. Um, you can, they make this sort of new kind of math, mathematical operations using this curve. So adding two numbers. So let's say I want to find p plus q. I find the line and then see where it goes. So for example, I want to add p and q. Here's p plus q. I draw a line between them, see where else it intersects, and then flip it on the x-axis. Um, and any line you make, choose two points, it will intersect in a third point. That's kind of the cool thing about this. You're like, well, wait, what if I go here? No, it's going to go there. What if I pick here? It's going to intersect there. What if I pick, you know, you're always going to find, for two points you choose, you will find a third intersection. Um, and you think, well, what if I make it like these two, and it goes way up here? Well, this curve curves increasingly upward. And no matter how steep your line is up there, it'll eventually hit somewhere up, up there. Um, so the addition procedure is draw a line, find the intersection, move down across the x-axis. Just if you want to choose, you want to add P and Q. You just, I want to add you P and Q. You initialize those. It's your choice, right? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just giving an example of two arbitrary points that you want to yeah, add. Why am I here? Just if, I'm just describing addition. If you want to add two things, okay, here are two points. They're sort of like numbers. Um, you know, if you want to add three and four, it's like, well, why pick three and four? Yeah, any number you can use. So, are they necessarily yeah. vectors, or is it taking a, a scalar and mapping it around them? They have to be points on the curve. Okay, so it's a scalar that's mapped for, yeah. Kind of, yeah, in practice, it, yeah, in practice you have an x and y coordinate in the Bitcoin space. So, how do you add p to p? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So, if you want to add p and p, oh, okay. you take the tangent. Uh, so let's say I want to add p and p. Well, you can't do it. P, well, if it's really at zero, then you then you you're not supposed to do that. Anyway, <laughs> but if you have a point like here, and I want to add p and p. Okay, you take the tangent at that point. It's sort of like imagine P and Q converging here, and like you find that line where it intersects. So, so that one is on the plane. Um, there's some exceptions for. There's a point at infinity or something. I forget. In practice, you don't worry about it, um, but there is some like conceptual point at infinity, and then it returns to the zero crossing, or like there's these zero crossings here. Um, but anyway, in, in practice, you don't have to worry about that. Um, so multiplication is just adding p to itself a bunch of times, right? So I have p, I find the tangent, go down here. OK, that's 2p. 
And what if I want to get 3p? I add p and 2p, right? Find a line. Here's where it intersects with. There's 3p. Uh, so this is how you multiply, essentially. By, you just keep, you know, if I want to find 3 times p, it's a you know, linear sequence of addition. The motivation being you want a deterministic way of deriving a, a private p and a public p. Or deriving a public p, just a private p, right? Yeah, with like, what? Ah, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, trying to connect. Oh, oh. That's not good. Well, regardless of your connection, let me. Different. <laughs> um, the multiplication exists to the extent that you can keep adding p to itself. There's no clear division, and there's no real subtraction. So given the points p and k times p, how can you find the multiplicand k? You kind of can't, right? You're going to have to try brute force. So if I say, here's a point, uh, you know, a million p. Or, no, I, I, you know, here's kp, here's p. You don't know whether it's 2, 3, 4, or a million, and you're going to have to calculate it yourself iteratively. So you make k huge, and then it's really hard to find. Uh, but if you make k huge yourself, Aren't you going to have to create, you know, one, two, three, four? No, you can double, right? You can add p to p. So you, you have the ability to double, and you have the ability to add. So you can quickly get to whatever number you want in, like, log base 2 and time. So, for example, you know, you can see how, like, if, you're, if you have the ability to double and the ability to add itself, you can get to a million pretty quick. You know, you double 10 times. Or whatever, and then you're at like a million. Or then you're at a thousand. I don't know. You double twenty times, you're at a million. So it's not that hard. Um, but given these points, okay, here's k times p, and here's p. I don't know what k is. And that's hard to find. Um, yeah. So the actual math involved in the encryption and decryption and signing with ECDSA would take a really long time. <laughs> but so like, hopefully you get the idea that this curve allows these one-way trapdoor functions, where since you know your initial starting point and k, you can calculate things much more quickly than someone who doesn't know this secret. Um, you can encrypt and decrypt and also sign, which is similar to encryption, but sort of the inverse in that the um, private key holder can sign, and any public key holder can verify that signature. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, and so this is so RSA. You can there are signature implementations with RSA, but they're kind of a fudge and are not as as easy as RSA itself. Is the curve always the same? Um, you can choose. There's a whole bunch of different curves. So this is like y squared x to the third plus minus four x plus two. So there's like a whole set of standardized curves. Bitcoin uses like SE. SECPK 256K1 or something. Um, and it's, you know, and so these are all specified. Okay, what is, what is the, um, you know, what's the, what's it called, the number before? <laughs> the thing, the, the coefficient, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the coefficient of x squared, what's the coefficient of x, and what's the coefficient of the, of the number after it? I think that, I don't remember. You can look it up. It's, it's some huge number. So this is mainly used for signing, or is it also um, used because it's easier like, than factoring, or it's hard, more difficult for someone to break the factor, it's also easier to choose the numbers? The advantage of ECDSA over RSA is it's very compact. Um, you can have small keys in terms of size, and they're quite secure for their size. So for RSA, you might have to have like a 4,000-bit key, to, to would be the equivalent of like a... 256-bit key in ECDSA. I'm, I might be a little off by there. Um, and also the signatures are also quite small. When you sign, um, it's still a few hundred bits, whereas a RSA, RSA is not great for signatures. <coughs> okay, so you have this ECDSA signature. So those yeah. points on the curve, those are kind of bits in your message that you just calculate a new position for each one, or how do those X and Y's get, how do those translate to the message itself? Your C, 
signature. You, okay, so you sign a hash of a message because you want a fixed size that you're signing, and you end up taking it to like you exponentiate modulo a prime using these points. Uh, it's yeah, it's, it's <laughs> there's a I mean you can go through it step by step, but it's it's quite a bit longer sequentially than the RSA algorithm or Diffie Hellman. There's like a lot of steps involved, and so you know there's an ephemeral key that you need to keep random and stuff. So I can again by having that kind of public version of it, you can verify that it's right. If you have the public number uh, p, you can you can find you can verify that it happens. Um, you know it's easy to verify a signature. Okay, so EC. So now I'll sort of transition into payment systems, right? ECDSA is really cool, and we could make a payment system with this, right? Because it's a verifiable, undeniable signature that someone's using. So your name, you know, is the public key, and your password is the private key. And I can sign a transaction saying I pay you $20, and then you can use that same signed transaction, you know, that signature, and sign it yourself to send the $20 to someone else. So I think we're on to something. We can have a global payment system, right? So here's the first attempt. Everyone can sign their transactions, send them to each other, and move money around that way. Right? So Alice sends $10 to Bob, Bob sends six to Sally, one to Ken, and three back to himself. Um, and this, whoops. So we sign for transactions that have inputs and outputs and a signature. So somehow Alice starts with $10. I don't know how that gets started. Um, but then Alice sends to Bob 10, and she signs it and your signature is, you know, signed by Alice, CA, put it at some random looking number. Bob then signs with Bob's signature and outputs three to Bob, six to Sally, one to Ken. So we can see that, you know, if, if Sally wants to make sure Bob has what he says he has, you can trace it back and back to Alice. So this actually could be a cool global payment system, right? Problem so far, okay, everyone's identities and transactions are public, mm, not great. And where did Alice get those 10 bucks to start with? Also kind of questionable. So okay, what we'll do is we'll have these sort of addresses instead of names. And I know it's Alice, but all I see is the input is this you know, address, which is a public key. And the output you know, is also a public key. And it's signed with the private key that I can verify. So this actually works great, right? We don't need to know who's behind all these random keys, even though the transactions are public. And it's a way to keep track of cryptographically provable transactions, right? Unfortunately, no. So signature only doesn't work, because what happens when Alice does this? She sends 10 to Bob, and she also signs a transaction sending 10 to Sally. OK, so this is a double spend. Uh, it's a legitimately signed transaction. You can verify it. But they're mutually exclusive. They can't both be true, because she only had $10, and she tried to send $10 to two different people. So who gets it? Uh, what do you do? You split it up, so Bob gets five and Sally gets five? Or you ignore both and ignore Alice altogether? Or you try to steal all of Alice's bitcoins? Um, it's a real problem. <laughs> and this is you know, what people were dealing with a long time. Okay, how do you prevent or deal with these? You ignore both? Well, maybe Bob doesn't know about Alice's transaction yet. And he already gave the product, you know, and afterwards this came out. Or you try to timestamp something. So okay, whatever happened first, that's the legit one. But timestamps are really easy to fake. I can always say like, no, this happened yesterday. See? Because you already know what happened yesterday. You can make it look like it happened yesterday. And then it's just he said, she said. Um, you have some kind of central server to timestamp things. But then if you have a central server, then you might as well just use a bank, and why do you even bother with the sole signature thing, right? And so the problem is, while the transactions are individually peer-to-peer -peer and trust-free, the sequence of the transactions is not. And that's what Bitcoin solves, right? So how can everyone agree on a sequence of something when they don't trust each other? Um, the signatures, that's taken care of. The only problem is, okay, what happened first? What happened next? So. One way to tackle this is called a proof of work. And Hashcash was the initial proof of work in like 97, yeah, by Adam Back, who's a smart guy working on Bitcoin stuff now. Um, he uses a partial hash collision with zero. So what that means is you try to find a hash output that's got a lot of zeros in it. 
in Bitcoin's case, they're in the beginning. You try to find a low number for your hash output. And there's no way to you know, design an input to do that. You're just gonna have to guess and check a gazillion different inputs and find, and then eventually you'll find a hash output that starts with a bunch of zeros. And that proves that you did a lot of pointless work by feeding all these inputs into the hash function. So the idea is you have a target T. So for hash cache, the idea was you have a target T, a message M, a nonce N, which is the number you increment and try different, and a hash function H. Okay, so the sender and receiver agree on the hash function and they agree on the target, you know, the, the difficulty beforehand. So there's a sort of call response where the sender finds a hash output such that the hash of the message concatenated with the nonce is less than t. Um, so let's say the hash is like a 128-bit hash function, and t can be maybe like 2 to the 96. So that means you're going to have to try, on average, 2 to the 32 or 4 billion nonces before you find one that takes your message, your message hash output down low enough. Um, so you send the message, you send the nonce. Uh, you don't have to send the hash output because there's no point in doing so. The receiver then computes the hash of M and N and sees, okay, if H out is less than T, this message is okay. He did four billion pointless computations to give me this number N and using this message M. And I will now accept this message. So why do you have this? It's not really encrypted. There's no secrets. It's expensive for the sender, right? The sender needs to compute sort of O two to the N. And in this case, it was N was like, 32. You can, you can make it whatever you want. Um, and then it can get pretty big. It's cheap for the receiver, who just computes one time uh, to verify the message. So the original idea was to stop email spam in the late 90s. And the idea was, you set T such the average PC can find the correct nonce in like a second or maybe less. So if you're emailing your friend, your computer just sort of churns for a second when you send an email, which is no big deal. Um, but if a spammer is trying to send a million emails, his computer is only going to be able to send one email a second. And that's going to really slow them down and make it expensive. Um, so it didn't actually take off. I don't know why. It never really got off the ground. No one ever really used Hashcash. It's a cool idea, though. Um, but the idea of a proof of work is used in Bitcoin. So the proof of work is useful because it can't be faked unless you somehow break SHA-2. Um, there's no identity involved. You don't care who's sending what. It's just everyone can compute this the same. Um, it's based on a physical resource, so you can't like have a bunch of IP addresses and appear to be bigger than you are. You need to actually have the computers computing this. And anyone can quickly verify it. So here's how to agree on a sequence. You take all the transactions you know about that you've seen on the network, and you make sure they're legit. So you check their signatures, the, their inputs and outputs line up. Then you add a nonce, any number, you're going to try one, two, three, four. And you hash the whole thing. So your output is SHA-256 of all the transactions and your nonce. And you keep trying until you get a really low output, below a target, say 2 to the 240 or something. That's pretty easy. Okay, when you do, you send everyone this transaction and nonce block. Okay, well that shows that someone has verified those transactions and did some work. You know, there's sort of a, a stamp on that saying, okay, someone had all these transactions, someone did a bunch of work. That alone is not enough. What you also do is you include the hash of the previous block. So now your output is SHA-256 of the hash of the previous one, plus the new transactions, plus the nuts. And by plus, I mean concatenated. That's it. That's essentially the breakthrough of Bitcoin. Um, and the reason this works Every block references the previous block. And so if you change something in the past, everything breaks in the future. You know, everything breaks after that. So it breaks the chain of hash outputs, right? Because one bit change in the hash input will completely change the hash output. And since that hash output changes, when you try to feed it into the next one, it's all going to be different. So any change back here, flipping a single bit, will destroy the whole thing. Yeah? So if you're proof of work, you're just iterating through nonces? Yep. What's to prevent someone malicious from just iterating through permutations of the sequence of transactions? That's okay. You can take trans. I mean, in practice, they do. Um, it doesn't matter. If you you know, if you run out of nonces, so in Bitcoin, you actually only have four bytes of nonces, so you run out of that in like a fraction of a second at this point. Well, um, so you should find like a low enough number by giving a false ordering of the sequence. 
It's okay because you know there's no real sequence internally to a block. It's just this happened in this 10 minute period. And you don't care when in that 10 minute period as long as it was some point. You know, so you can rearrange the transaction order within a block. It's okay. It's it's not good for like critical timing on the second level, but if all you want to know is okay, last week this was in a block, then well, it works. I guess it matters like what parties are involved, right? Like what part of your of your diagram of your of your acyclic graph that's been included in this transaction. Is that, how many transactions per block typically? Couple hundred right now. Uh, maybe you could probably extend that to a few thousand. Limit or in practice? In practice, right now it's a few hundred, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you could make them big, uh, but it doesn't really matter internally to the block. You can you can also have you can shuffle things around. It doesn't really matter because all you you care about is this transaction happened in a certain block in the past, and that's going to be really hard to rewrite because. If you try to change that transaction, so like I think Alice sent Bob 10 bucks, um, but if Alice wants to change it to, no, I sent Charlie 10 bucks, she's got to go all the way back down here, change the bits here, and that's going to break the entire chain up. And so you're going to see, like, well, you can't, it's not valid, and then I have this, right? These could have different transactions in them, but I just pick the longest. The longest chain is the valid one, because that has the most work. Um, so an attacker, yeah, attacker trying to rewrite a sequence would have to redo all the blocks. So if I attack here and I say, no, I don't want this, I want to go here, I'm going to have to build all the blocks up higher than the current chain. Yeah? Maybe it, it's uh, past that 32 bit bound, so we know. Oh, way past. So, so in practice, um, I don't know what the hardware does now, but like many billions of hashes per second, and since you only get 4 billion, com you know, four billion po possible states with that nuts, what they do is they do all these little tricks, like they change the time. So it's this is a simplification, right? It's not actually hash transactions nuts. It's all sorts of things. Uh, there's like time involved, there's a version number. You don't actually include the transactions, you can include a Merkle root of the transactions, which is sort of like a hash of all the transactions. Um, so there's there's other places where you can start flipping bits really quick to get more, more space in the nuts. And if that fails, you can rearrange the order of transactions, like you said, or you can change your Coinbase transaction, which I will Get to it in a second. <laughs> yeah. Quick question. So, um, what I'm hearing from you is that uh, the nonce is so small that nonce uh, allocation or nonce domain allocation to specific miners doesn't gain you an advantage. Meaning, like, if we're all in a pool, yeah, I you say, don't split up the nonce. Okay. It's just, it used factors. to be. It used to be big enough because you only needed to do hundreds of millions of hashes to find a block. But at this point, you have to do like some ridiculous number. <laughs> and so your, your, your one nonce block, you're going to iterate through that really quick. And you're going to have to change other things to make sure that the different, different hash outputs happen. Um, but it doesn't really change this. If you can imagine if there were eight, bit, eight bytes of nonce, then we could just change the nonce. Um, since there aren't, we have to change other things. One of the big ones is just change the time. So every second, the, there's a time field in here, too. So you can just change the time every second. So every second you get a new try. Um, OK, so hard to, hard to rewrite history. And since the keep, system keeps rolling, generating new blocks, if you want to attack this system, you've got to be going faster than everyone else combined. And that's the 51% you know, attack that people know. OK, so, what, so Bitcoin itself, what about the initial creation? How does Alice get that 10 bucks? So kind of a cool idea. Uh, they're not dollars, they're coins. And this is totally separate currency which is sort of the thinking out of the box part of this. Each block found can include one free unsigned transaction that has no input. And it outputs to wherever you want it to. So obviously you output it to the public key for a private key you have. And initially it was 50 coins. Now it's down to 25. Um, so every hash computed has an equal chance of finding a valid block. So it's just this giant parallel computation where everyone's trying to find that uh, valid hash output. Um, so here's the problem. Lots of people joining means that blocks will be found more quickly, right? So what Bitcoin does is it limits blocks discovery to a target one per 10 minutes. So every 2016 blocks, which ends up being about two weeks, uh, you check, everyone checks, okay, how long did it take for these last 2016 blocks? And if it took two weeks, great. You leave your difficulty, your target the same. If it took more than two weeks, you increase T, the number it has to be less than, so you make it easier. If it was less than two weeks, you decrease T and make it harder to find. That way you have this sort of equilibrium where yeah, blocks come out, 
It's a Poisson process, so it's on average one every 10 minutes. And so this is Bitcoin. Uh, these are the specifics that I've talked about. The specifics don't really matter. So in this case, it's 10 minutes, 50 coins a block, SHA-2. That's just what some random person or people decided. Um, it would still work if it was 30 minute block time and 1,000 coins a block and you used RIPEMP 320 instead. Um, so the main breakthrough was feeding proof of works into each other to create this really hard to break chain that's sequential. I had a question on the last one. How do, you, how do the miners actually agree to the difficulty when, during the difficulty change? Oh, so you have block, you know, let's say current block is N. N minus 2016, the blocks all have a timestamp yeah. that's you know, signed and stuff. So we just, just deterministically it. subtract these two and if it's, so in practice it's never exactly two weeks. Um, <laughs> you're always gonna have a little up or down. Um, and everyone can, you know, everyone can see these two timestamps. So yeah, if you were the miner finding the 2016th block, you could try to push it a little forward or back because there's a little bit of a uh, slop in terms of time. But you're blocking two hours. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like you're rejected. Red 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 red. Yeah. If if you're like way so in practice is not in practice. So one of the things that's Bitcoin is sort of this like totally trustless, mathematically pure thing. You're assuming everyone agrees what time it is. That is one of the assumptions in Bitcoin. In practice, everyone agrees what time it is. Um, you don't have the problem of you're you're firing up your computer trying to connect the blockchain and you're like. Is it Tuesday or Wednesday or is it <laughs> Thursday? I have no idea what day it is. Because that would actually open things up to a bunch of problems and attacks. Right, like if you selected a really low difficulty, all of a sudden people yeah, make Yeah, but a in, in practice, if you're like, it's, it's, you know, next week, and everyone's like, no, it's not. Who's this crazy guy? And they disconnect you. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it is a sort of cool theoretical thing. Okay, got to keep going. Okay, we're almost done. Okay, so yeah, this is, uh, yeah, you reward the proof of work with coins. This is a little chart of the actual in practice difficulty. Um, here's difficulty one, which took a couple billion, I think, a couple hundred million computations. And this is a log scale. So the difficulty is like a lot. Um, and you know, it's gajillions of hashes per second at this point. I don't even know what number. Six hundred. Uh, X, uh, I don't know. Six, 600 times 140 penta. Yeah, it, it's a lot. It keeps going up. It's crazy. Don't don't mind. You lose money. What do you attribute the kind of flatness? Okay, okay. So first thing, nobody used it. So 2009, 2010, January, nobody uses this. They're probably just Satoshi and maybe one or two super nerds who are now millionaires. Um, <laughs> starts getting some some traction. Like, oh, this is kind of cool thing. Right here is when the first um, GPU mining algorithm, you know, got released. So you see, like, the, the actual the difficulty adjustment is a maximum of x4 or x.25. So it can't, there's a sort of limit here. Um, and you hit that limit here. And I think that's the only time you hit it, when the GPUs start getting fired up. And you have a huge increase there. Um, and this is more and more GPUs coming. This was like a little bit of a bubble to 30 bucks. So, so price does influence it. Uh, and then 2012, not much was going on, some FPGA stuff. And then early 2013, you start getting different ASICs coming out going up, I don't know, five orders of magnitude or something. So not only were the ASICs not developing, but people like, have interest in us. Well, yeah, initially it was, so this is CPU. Here's where GPU starts. Here's CPU, CPU, more interest. GPU starts, this is like GPU all the way up to here. Starting to get FPGAs, but not a lot of interest in 2012. And then FPGAs never really did anything. And then starting to get ASICs up to that curve. It's like almost a year of like kind of consistent hash power. Yeah, 2012 was boring. I, I lost interest in Bitcoin to a great extent. I didn't really do much. It depends on price, too. You're not going to mine yeah. 2006. for electricity if the price is well. Your coin 30, yeah. rewards. 2006, it was like 10 bucks. Not even. It was like 5 to 10 bucks the whole year. Nothing much happened. Um, should have bought should have it. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so this seems to have worked. Uh, something like 2 to the 80 SHA-2 operations have happened in Bitcoin, which is some ungodly number. I actually don't know because it does like SHA-2 or SHA-2, but I don't know if it's 2 to 80, 2 to 81. Anyway, um, so these initially valueless tokens are now worth quite a bit of, you know, normal old, old school money. It's open source, so there's lots of forks and modifications. All the pieces were there for over a decade. You know, ECDSA and SHA-2 are the really main pieces. Um, it took some clever design to put them together, as well as some out-of-the-box thinking, and you will not find who made this. Uh, they invented Bitcoin. They don't want you to find them. 
they win. You know, you're not going to find, yeah, they, they're that confident. I mean, come on. Okay, so yeah, this is all specific. So part two will be more specific implementation details, such as there's all these sort of things. Like a coin is not actually an atomic unit. 100 million atomic units are in a coin. There's no balances. There's only inputs and outputs. Transaction fees and how that works uh, with miners. Outputs are actually conditional scripts, not direct outputs to public keys. Addresses are actually hashes of public keys. And they have some, some checking. It's, it's all crazy. Uh, much, much more. OK, so that's my presentation. Hopefully questions. I imagine there'll be some few minutes of everyone listening questions. And slowly it will degrade into people talking and asking questions over here. And that sounds good. Quick. Yeah, uh, we're out. We're really running out of time because oh. we're going to have to be out of here by nine. And, oh, um, oh. So we're going to take. Uh, uh, please take a few questions, but um, we're going to, you know, uh, end on nine on the dot. Okay. And clear out, clean up. Cool. Um, cool. And head down to the city beer store, which is right on. Cold city Center. beer store. City beer store. More beer. Is it a uh, store or like a bar? There you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Cool. So that's the idea. Cool. Okay, yeah, questions. Um, to your knowledge, are there any alphabetic or mechanical crypto systems still in use and effective? Effective? No, I mean, they have, they have cell phones now, they can do way better. But yeah, like, if you want to be like steampunk, you could probably make some cool <laughs> uh, Enigma, whatever system. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty good. They, they kind of, you could probably make, with, with current knowledge, you could probably make a pretty cool mechanical cipher system. Uh, that would be that would definitely get on the top of Reddit or something. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's like why bother? Because you got these chips that cost nothing and do it so much faster. So not a lot of research in that. Any other? Yeah. Uh, can you recommend any best practices for working with uh, filing software with crypto governments? Um, don't write your own crypto. Look for you know peer-reviewed things that people have tested a lot and you know are. Open source, if it's like a closed source thing, it's like, I will encrypt your key. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so yeah, open source, academically reviewed, and not too new also. So, so it's like a balance. Like you, you might think, oh, well, the new crypto is probably better than the old. Maybe, but maybe it's only been around a year or two, and so people haven't found the problems. Um, so that's sort of a limit thing. Like maybe 10 to 15 years old is probably pretty safe and probably cutting edge enough. So that's so something. Pretty much, yeah. ECDSA is like 15 years old or something, and SHA-2 is like from 2001. So yeah, Just not that old. Just kind of like an interesting note on that is like the curve that... Yeah, the Toblitz curve, made. not the random one. Yeah, and so like he didn't choose one that the NSA kind of like said, oh, chose, we should use yeah. these. Um, he actually chose one that... Yeah, maybe he knows something we don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, in, in, theory, in theory, they're all secure and they're still used, but yeah, who knows? Yeah. So let's say that... Let's say someone did break uh, SHA-256, and uh, everyone agreed to move to another algorithm. That would still be OK, right? Because yeah, every can... miner said, OK, we are going to use uh, this. The miners algorithm. would be unhappy, because they have a lot of I ships see. that do SHA-256. <laughs> but they might say, well, OK, fine, we'll move to. And even if the miners don't, I'm moving to SHA-3 or whatever. If SHA-256 is broken, yeah, yeah but evacuate. Then, but then oh. if the, the uh, ECDSA is broken, yeah, then we're screwed. Then well, so if you've never spent from your address, no one actually knows the, pri the public key. Okay. Uh, it's a hash of the public key. So if, what, RIPMB160 is broken, so you can reverse it, which is not going to happen, and ECDSA is broken, then we're uh, in trouble. We should, what? Last question, last question. Or maybe, yeah, yeah. I like the way that you built up a digital payment system and you ended up with Bitcoin. <laughs> and uh, do you know if anyone has done something like that for a system like Ripple or Stellar? So uh, there's, there's a lot of cool payment systems that I think, it, now that Bitcoin's like a thing, there's a lot of cool older systems that people wanted to do um, in like the 90s and early 2000s. Um, Chalmian Blinded Cash, uh, Peppercoin, which predates Bitcoin by a decade. There's a bunch of cool systems people were thinking of and that have a lot of cool cryptography behind them, but never got off the ground because they always depended mm -hmm. on existing banks helping out. And um, there's always sort of this trusted third party that the bank issues these tokens and you can spend them. Um, now that Bitcoin's out, you could make your own bank very easily and have a Chalmian blinded cash or you know, probabilistic payment system and stuff. Um, so yeah, like the R in RSA, Rivist, if you go to his homepage on MIT, he's got like all these awesome ideas. But they're all like 15 <laughs> years old and like, I don't know what he's doing now. He should, he should come here and 
start making Bitcoin stuff. So. <laughs> Do you have any comment on uh, Ripple or Stellar and the cryptography? Uh, it's it's not as interesting to me as Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, it's it might be it might be a legit. It's sort of a, a hybrid in that like you're sort of trusting uh, essentially banks to help out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.